Hi, this is Farhan Siddiqui and you're watching The Ace Town Show. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show The Ace Town Show with Farhan Siddiqui. Today I have brought a very very great person personality at my show and he is a humble person, a kind person, politician, attorney and you know what? I'm talking about the city council member, Mr. Edward Paul. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. Mr. Edward, I was just looking at your bio and I was really confused. Like, where should I start with? You have been an athlete, you have been an attorney. Yes. You, I mean, I was very surprised that, you know, you did the basketball thing. Yes. I want you to please tell something about you to my audience. Like, how did you start your career? Yes. You know, what really triggered you to be a politician? So, please. Yes. So, thank you for having me. Um, I'm a proud product of Southwest Houston. I grew up right here in Southwest Houston, and I'm proud and honored to represent Southwest Houston on city council. I went off to Atlanta to get my undergrad from Morehouse College in political science. After that, I played basketball professionally in Chile as well as in Singapore. I had a great experience, got to travel the world and broaden my horizon, but I always wanted to be an attorney. And so I came back to Houston, and I attended Thurgood Marshall School of Law at Texas Southern received my Juris Doctorate there. It was actually in law school where I caught the political bug. I did an internship at the state capitol in Austin, uh, rep working for a state representative, and I told myself one day I want to represent the people. And so once I graduated from law school, I started to get really involved in my community and start getting involved in different political organizations. I ran for state representative four or five years ago and came up short. But people start to get to know who I am and understand what I stand for. And recently, the city council seat became open. And I decided to run for that. And I won that seat in December and have been in office for about eight months. I've always had a passion for people and a passion for service that derives from my family. They've always been very engaged in community and taught me that at a, at a young age. And so I'm just continuing that legacy. So, council member, the transition period from being athlete to the politician slash the attorney. What were the hardships you faced? Because you are an inspiration to my youth, the younger people who are basically working towards their professional career or something. How would you define this? So, you know, whatever you want in life, nothing worth having comes easy. And so it was always a struggle to advance, especially as a minority. And so, I, as a young child, I used to dream about playing basketball. I got a basketball scholarship to go to college and I used that to get my education. But I also knew that basketball was not going to last forever. And I uh, wanted to think about what would I do after my playing career. And so, that's why I went back to law school. Law school was extremely tough. Uh, taking the bar exam was extremely tough. Uh, and even running for office is extremely tough. And I did not win the first time that I ran. Uh, but I stayed out there, stayed diligent, did not get discouraged. And, you know, I tell myself that internship that I mentioned, that was in 2011. I did not get elected until 2019. So that's almost a decade of perseverance and never giving up and reaching for your, your dream. And it paid off. So my next question is, as a as a community leader, because you have done a great job, whether you were an athlete, you were a politician, you were an attorney, now you are a district J council member, district J. And I read that the district J is now a best place to live, work and visit. How are you managing all those things? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm proud to, to represent district J, which is Southwest Houston, Gulfton, Sharpstown, Westwood, Brayburn and Ailey. We're the most diverse district in the most diverse city in the entire country. And so we represent so many different cultures, ethnicities, backgrounds, faiths, uh, interests. And for me, that's exciting because it allows me to be open-minded, to hear from different sides, different perspectives, uh, to make sure that I represent their interests at City Hall. Uh, Council Member, when you took over this position, when you took your office, so what challenges you had or what you decided that in which areas you have to focus on to make the improvements? So yeah, always public safety will be number one. We want to make sure that people feel safe and secure in their homes, going to the grocery stores. 
but we also want to make sure that our streets are drivable, that our streets don't flood, that our streets are clean, right? And so all of those things are quality of life issues that we try to focus on. I don't try to get into the politics of the left and to the right. I stay focused on quality of life issues, making sure that the tax dollars that people pay, that we're using them effective and efficiently, and that's my focus. Your sense of connecting with the communities, regardless, as you mentioned in your bio as well, that whether they are Democrats, whether they are um, whoever they are, and belong to any community, and which you have showed already that by doing conducting like food drives, you know, the COVID testing facilities, the computer labs. So what are the other plans which you think can bring the communities closer? Yeah. So I'm always open to engaging different communities. That's the reason that I'm on your show today, to reach out to the Indian and the Pakistani community, to let them know that I'm their representative on city council, to be engaging so that they know who I am, what I stand for, that they know that they can reach out to my office regarding their issues and concerns, and so that we can keep an open line of communication and dialogue. I work for them, I tell people all the time, uh, I'm an employee of the people. I went around and knocked on their doors and asked for their vote so that they can hire me to work for them. And being on your show is something that continues that engagement for your community. How are you projecting the COVID-19 numbers in District J or the, the adjacent areas? So unfortunately, the numbers in Southwest Houston, specifically District J, are high when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, we have three of the top nine zip codes for positive cases. but. We, there's a lot of variables that lead to that. We're also the most densely populated area of the city of Houston. So we have a lot of people in a small area, primarily because over 85% of our residents live in apartment complexes. Right. And when you live in an apartment complex, you have a lot of people in a concentrated area. So it's hard to socially distance. So that can uh, help with the community spread. Also, we have a lot of different languages, cultures, ethnicities, and backgrounds. So you're going to have language barriers. You're going to have culture barriers. Um, when you have a lot of different languages spoken, when you're trying to deliver the message of why it's important to wear your mask or why it's important to not go to large gatherings, um, you have to be able to relay that message in a language that they understand. And so that's why it's important for me to reach out to you and other community leaders, nonprofits, churches, apartment complexes, so that we can give them the accurate information and then use people in their community that they trust to disseminate their information. Council member, I have noticed that there are some people who have some kind of a sym symptoms for the COVID-19, but they are not cooperating, they are not going out and getting tested. What kind of a message you want to give them? I want them to know that we have available testing all throughout the city and the testing is free and the testing doesn't matter if you are documented or undocumented, refugee, from here, not from here, uh, there's ability for you to go and get tested. And it's extremely important to go get tested because you want to know your status, whether you're positive or not. If you are positive, it allows you to know so you can have your family and friends uh, be aware so you can stay away from them and not give it to them. And if you're not positive, that's great. We'll notate that from the city and show that we have a non-positive case. The more non-positive cases we get, the closer we get back to going back to normal. And that's what we want. Council member, actually, I spoke with a couple of people in my community and out of my community. What they are telling us that if they are planning to go to any of the testing site, the requirement is to produce an identity document or an insurance information so they can get tested. For example, if they don't have either piece of information, what should they do? Well, they don't need insurance for sure. And every testing site is different when it comes to uh, identification. Uh, we have to have some way to track you so that once we get the information, we can accurately know who you are and to give that information to you after the fact. But you want to call uh, the different testing locations and see what the requirements are. You can go on the City of Houston's website to see all the different locations and there'll be a number there that you can call beforehand to get additional details. There is another issue which uh, communities have 
I've been talking with the community very deeply and then what they had said that once they get tested, the testing time, like the results time is taking too long. By the time they get the results, their um, isolation period is gone. Yes. So what are we doing in that area? So initially we were having some lag times because we we're using national labs to send the uh, testing kits to and it was an overload. But as time has gone on, the system has become much more efficient and effective and less people are going to get tested so the results are coming in quicker. So don't let that deter you. Continue to go and get tested. The uh, response times are being quicker. Council member, I have seen that you are really working hard to make District J a model, a sample for the other district people. I have just read somewhere and I've seen a couple of examples where the solid waste management, you're, you're working with the solid waste management people, they are uh, lift, uh, pressure washing, lifting the trash or something, especially like Chimney Rock to the Beltway 8 area, the all the underpasses. How long this will gonna be continued? Is it like a routine cleaning process yes. or? So right now we understand that the underpasses are becoming dangerous. Uh, not only dangerous, uh, they are becoming a health hazard. And we wanna make sure that we maintain those underpasses so that our communities are safe and clean. And so we have committed to every, at least at the minimum, every two weeks, cleaning every underpass in District J, which is 59 South between Chimney Rock and the Beltway. And what we've been doing is picking up trash, uh, power washing, as well as sanitizing the area uh, so that when you're driving under there, uh, you won't see a lot of the debris and some of the uh, unsightliness that causes our communities uh, to not be as aesthetically pleasing. Council member, we were expecting Laura last week. Did you think that uh, the city of Houston was ready to face this kind of a hurricane? Like what other measurements we made? Do you want to just explain Yes, uh, for sure. Uh, it, it's a blessing that we did not okay. get the brunt of that hurricane. Thanks, Scott. Um, but, you know, Houston is extremely resilient. And we take storms very serious, especially since Hurricane Harvey. And because of that, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about response. We've learned a lot about preparation. We've learned a lot about whether to evacuate or not. We've learned about a lot about how to get out the information. And so we just wanted to be as prepared as possible if something did occur. And um, at the last second, on the last day, it kind of turned uh, what east. And it, the brunt of it actually went towards Louisiana. But we didn't want to... Uh, we want to make sure we were more safe than sorry. And so we are extremely prepared uh, for whatever may have hit. And thank God nothing did hit this time. But in the case that anything happens in the future, we'll definitely be prepared. Council Member, we had a third anniversary of Harvey last Saturday. God forbid, God forbid, if we come across with this kind of a hurricane again in the future, you think our city is ready? Yes, because what you have to understand is Hurricane Harvey was one of the worst disasters in the history of our nation. And guess what? We're still standing today, right? So that shows you that even if a, a, a terrible storm comes our way, we're resilient enough to withstand it. And based on what we experienced uh, three years ago, we're much better prepared now. And so the city has been purchasing more uh, equipment, uh, more rescue vehicles, there's more training with our first responders, and our the way we disseminate information online through text messages, through calls, and through the media, uh, we're much better prepared than we were even three years ago. Council member, tell us something about the rental relief program, which uh, Mayor Turner introduced, and then you have been working really diligently and hardworking day and night do you want to share some experience about that? Yeah. So we understand that the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted uh, low-income communities uh, the most. And a lot of the low-income communities, the residents live in apartments. And so since they were not able to work, they were not able to pay their rent and caused them the unfortunate chance of being evicted. So we wanted to do all that we could to aid them so that they could stay in their homes. 
So the first round we put out a, about a month or two ago, that was $15 million, but it was first come, first serve, and the money went really quick. So we had to learn a lot about that experience. A couple weeks ago, we put out a new fund that was an additional 20 million from the city, and I believe another 25 million from the county. And that is a program that won't be first come, first serve, but it will be worst first. So we'll assess each applicant and see uh, the needs of that applicant and then apply the funds based on the need. The great thing about this new fund, though, is if any apartment owner or landlord becomes a part of this program and, and gets assistance for one tenant, it covers for all the tenants. And so what that means is if one person in a complex receives the, the funds and cannot be evicted, that landlord or property owner can no longer evict anyone in that property. And so we're able to leverage those dollars so that more people will be impacted by it. Ladies and gentlemen, we will take a short break. It's been really uh, interesting uh, conversation I'm having with uh, the council member Edward Pollack. Uh, don't go anywhere and keep watching JCTV US. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I again welcome you on my show, The Ace Town Show with Farhan Siddiqui. I have an honor talking with Mr. Uh, Edward Pollard, who is a city council member of District J. Council member, uh, we want to know about the businesses in the District J. I know you are taking so many great uh, efforts to make the District J really good. What are the, the, for the businesses you are planning for? So with the businesses, we have been reaching out since day one to understand their needs let them know that they can reach out to our office regarding their business issues and concerns. I'm proud that the city of Houston has currently put out a small business relief fund for small businesses who are in need with an opportunity to get up to $50,000 uh, in grant money to help them with their business. And so they can go on the city of Houston's website right now to apply for those funds because we understand that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really impacted small businesses and we want to do all that we can to help them during this time. Are there any certain requirement council member to apply for this kind of a grant? Yeah, there are going to there is going to be some requirements and there's going to be an application process and so you want to go online and see what those are. I've been told that it's not um, too aggressive to where people are intimidated by applying and it shouldn't take too long for you to apply. So go on there and see the documents that you need to provide so that you can get the funding that you need. Council member, District J is so diverse, as you also mentioned that. Do we have any kind of a committee or any uh, group of people who belong to different ethnicities or uh, different uh, minority communities especially? Do we have something like that? So we do have different boards and commissions. Uh, district J has a management district which is a body of people who um, decide on different beautification projects, uh, patrol, um, cleanup initiatives. We also have individuals who sit on what's called a TERS board, which is consistent of um, business owners and residents uh, that focus more on infrastructure, streets, drainage, sidewalks. And so there are plenty of opportunities to serve and to be engaged. Uh, you should reach out to our office if you're interested in serving in a different volunteer community capacity. And we'll hear from you what your interests and your passions are and try to uh, appoint you to something that we believe would be uh, good for the city and for the district. Council member, uh, I'd like to know the importance of the census. Your efforts, your hard work towards the census 2020, how this program or what are the efforts behind this? I want you to yes. please explain this to the community. So the census is extremely important. The census is taken every 10 years by the federal government so that we can get a proper head count of the people who live in our communities so that the federal government can allocate dollars for our community for schools, for programs, for roads, uh, for all types of assistance. And so I tell people all the time to look at the census as an RSVP. 
when someone invites you to a party or a wedding, they ask you to RSVP so that they know if you are coming or not. That's because they want to be able to properly prepare for the number of people that may attend. If you send out a invitation and say, hey, I need to know if you're coming to the wedding. If only 10 people say they're coming to the wedding, they're only going to prepare enough food and drinks and supplies for those 10 people. So if 50 people end up showing, they're not going to have as much food to go around. So everyone is splitting up the food. That's how you have to look at the census. We're asking everyone to please fill out the census, which you can go to my2020census.com and fill out the census survey so that we know that you live in a particular area so that we can make sure that those dollars get to your area. If we do not know that you're there and you're not counted, we miss out on money. And for every 1% of Houstonians that do not fill out the census, we lose $250 million per 1%. So that's how important it is for people to fill out that census survey so that we know how many people live in your community so we can make sure we have enough dollars to put in your community. Council member, I had a question uh, received from one of my viewers. She was asking me in order to get registered in the census 2020, does she need to be like a, a green card holder or a citizen or anybody can go? Anyone. Doc, wow. uh, your status does not matter and they will not ask you your status on the census. It's basically going to ask you who you are, how many people are in your family, where do you live. That's it. It's not going to ask you if you're a citizen, documented, green card, work visa, none of that. They just want to know if you're alive All right. and where you reside. That's it. So community folks, please go on the website, get registered yourself on the census. As just council member said that you don't need any kind of a green card or citizenship document to get registered for the census 2020. And please do cooperate with the government, cover with the city of Houston so you can be registered and recognized in the Houston. Council member, my next question to you is, what are the measurements you are taking to make District J schools an example? So, from a city council perspective, uh, we try to work as closely as we can with um, HISD in the, in, the, in the different school districts on programming and academics. Uh, so what I do as a council member is I try to focus on after school programs, uh, making sure that our students have a safe place to be after school so they're not getting in trouble. I'm also focusing on trying to make sure that our students have technology and computer access, especially internet. Uh, right now, schools are starting virtually, and some people just don't have the access to the technology and the internet. And so we want to make sure that they do have that so that they don't get fall behind. And so we're always talking to the different principals, talking to parents at the schools to see what those specific needs are, and then we try to address them at the city level. That's a wonderful number. I know you are basically uh, creating uh, or in fact urging communities to come closer with the HPD or the other di different departments. And you have just recently did something with the police reforms or the police policies or something. Yeah. I want you to please explain about that too. So as many of you are aware, you know, police reform and social justice is at the forefront of society right now. And what we are aiming to do as council members is to work in collaboration with our police officers to understand in what ways we can make our department stronger. And what we've been doing as council members is looking around the country at what other cities and departments are doing that are uh, efficient and effective. And what can we do here locally to make our department stronger? And recently, council members have written a letter to the mayor with some of those recommendations for him to consider so that we can work collectively with the mayor's administration, our constituents, and police officers to make our city more safe and just for us all. District J, the, the crime perspective, I'm talking about the crime uh, perspective at the District J, how much we have covered so far? Like what, is, what are the control measures we took to control the crimes in the District J? 
Well, right now, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, some crime has gone up. And so we try to put more police presence in neighborhoods uh, with, a, with a strategy that coincides with the locations and time that crimes are most prevalent. My office is going to be debuting a District J patrol in the next few weeks, which we've partnered with HPD to have additional officers in our communities that will be paid overtime pay uh, to focus on quality of life issues. So HPD is spread very thin and they only can do but so much. So they're gonna prioritize high crimes first. So rapes, assaults, murders, burglaries, but such things that we see on a day-to-day -day in our neighborhoods, such as panhandling, uh, loitering, public nuisance, trespassing, jump motor vehicles, parking on the lawn. Those are things that are important too, but they're lower on the totem pole. So our District J patrol is going to be implemented to focus just on those lower level neighborhood type crimes and violations. And we think it will make our neighborhoods much more safer and they'll look much better as well. Council member, are you intending to increase the force in HPD? So each year, uh, well, recently city council has um, approved a budget that has additional cadet classes for HPD. And so I believe this year we'll have an additional four or five HPD cadet classes. And when they graduate out of those cadet classes, that will increase our police presence and the number of officers on the force. Okay. Last question, this is uh, security related. So are we going to form any community thing that we're watch neighborhood kind of a thing in uh, District J? Are you planning to launch something like that? So um, with the District J patrol, there is a component called the um, community committee. And it is stakeholders that we've identified from each neighborhood in District J that will sit on this community and be basically our eyes and our ears for that for that neighborhood. So Sharpstown may say we want you to focus on jump motor vehicles, but Gulfton may say we want you to focus on graffiti. And so we'll be able to take their voices and their input to let HPD know what areas they need to focus on in each community. There's also every month an opportunity for anyone in the area to participate in the positive, inter, the positive intervention program, which is a PIP program for the HPD. You can go on HPD websites and look to see when your PIP meeting for your neighborhood is, and that gives residents an opportunity to talk directly to HPD officers that patrol their area so that they can come up with strategies and ideas in which to make their communities more safe. Council member, uh, the religious safety places for the worship places, for example, mosques, I will be more particular about the mosque, whatever happened in New Zealand, India, Kashmir, and all those places. Are we taking any safety measures specifically for the worship places for the mosque in District J? Yeah, so District J, we have many different uh, religious faiths, and um, based on that, we have a lot of different church, mosques, temples, and there is increased presence uh, in those areas, especially around the times that people are convening. Not only do you have HPD, you have to also understand that we also have the constable's office, we also have the sheriff's office, we also have seal security in areas, so it's a combined effort and strategy to make sure that there's enough presence at the places and also staying engaged with each of the uh, leadership of the different um, religious institutions so that they can tell us in what ways that we can implement public safety and law enforcement in their areas to keep them safe. Council member, I did basic, my team did a survey with the people who go for the worship to the mosque and basically we did a very quick survey with the security issues, especially like the Imam who is just like a, a pastor mm -hmm. of the mosque. We asked them, so they are really satisfied with the security issues right now. You know, I basically went by myself to the three three mosques, and they all are very satisfied. The district J, and especially under your supervision, uh, they are all happy. And I really uh, say thank you to you and the especially the HPD, who are making every effort better and best to making all of us safe. Thank you very much for coming on my show, uh, Council Member.
and uh, probably we're going to invite you one more time and then we'll talk again on different I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Looking forward to next time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for keep watching my show. Um, as I said that, you know, I will bring Mr. Edward Pollard on my next show. I personally thank you and uh, I will continue to bring more city officials on my show so that way you will have a good understanding and the interaction with them. Thank you very much. Have a good day.